So this is our introductory session. Of all the sessions that I put on, I think this is the most important one because it explains the basics of concussion and how it happens, what the recovery is like. To help you understand the symptoms, how easily these injuries happen, how prevalent they are, and the healing process, which is different for everybody. Also to help you recognize that multiple concussions can lead to serious consequences that can impact your career, your relationships, and your future health. Is that dark enough for everybody to see, or do you want us to tone down the lights a bit? You can see that one. What's that? Can you just tone that one down? Um, try the light switch back there. The white one, turn all the fluorescent lights off. There, how's that? That's better. Better? Okay. And that's where, that's where I'm coming from is like I said, I, had, uh, I found out I had three prior concussions and I wasn't aware of that. And the fourth one came along and my life has never been the same since. And I'm always advocating here that it's important to educate yourself and do it now before you end up on the treadmill of too many doctors, too many pills and still not getting any answers. And I'm coming across so many people that are stuck in this wheel and not getting anywhere. I call it the big black hole. We also have a disclaimer that the ideas, suggestions, general principles, and conclusions presented are subject to your personal health and sound medical advice. Every possibility is not represented, nor do we presume that all possibilities relate to your particular situation. This awareness group is not a substitute for recognized medical advice or treatment. Always consult your doctor, your healthcare practitioner for medical advice. And we also have group guidelines, confidentiality, thoughts, feelings, experiences shared in this group will stay in this group. Respect others' right to keep their information private. Respect and accept what is unique to each attendee in the group. Be respectful of other spirituality, religion, and belief systems. Allow others equal time for sharing. And if you prefer to remain silent and pass on sharing at any time, please feel free to do so. And now is also a reminder to shut off your cell phones if you have any with you. And as I mentioned, our meeting structure will be changing. We first have a 20-minute presentation. We'll be covering different topics each meeting in a progressive manner, from the basics of concussion, coping strategies, resources, and therapies, and up to complications of multiple concussions leading traumatic brain injury. So uh, at the start, this is the very first one. So to me, I feel this is the most key meeting to come to because you get a good understanding of what a concussion really is. Then we're gonna have a 10 minute quiet time. There are some people that were here. I'm not sure with today's attendees, but some are very highly symptomatic and they can't go through the whole hour, an hour and a half uh, sitting and, and listening, so they've asked to have a 10 minute break. I'm not feeling well myself and I'm still getting over a strobe light incident in July, so I'm going to need that 10 minute break anyways. <laughs> oh. I don't like these buttons. I like my clicker better. Here we are. And then following the break, we'll have a 10 minute, uh, another 20-minute uh, presentation. Sometimes we will have guest speakers coming in. I have a vision therapist who wants to come in and, and talk, and I have uh, an idea, but I haven't started working on it yet. We want to get some family physicians in here to find out what they have to say when they are uh, encountered with uh, patients like this. And then afterwards, we'll be followed by a 30 to 40 minute uh, sharing circle. If the, the group needs another 10 minute break, we can sneak one in there before we have our circle. And so now we get into our intro session. What is a concussion? The term concussion conjures up the image of someone knocked unconscious while playing sports. But concussions, which is actually temporary loss of brain function, can happen with any type of head injury. Often without hitting your head, often without any loss of consciousness. And I highlight these two last points here because a lot of people still today I come across saying, well, I didn't hit my head. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't uh, knock myself out. Those aren't, it's that sudden movement and you're kind of dazed, that's a concussion. But if you have lost consciousness, that is certainly a more serious concussion. 
There's another description of uh, brain injury that can occur from a bump blow to the head or even a quick whipping motion of the head caused by a fall or blow to any part of the body, resulting in a cascading inflammatory reaction that changes the way the brain functions. Concussion is more than a knock on the head. It is very serious. And following the mechanical aspects of concussion and damage to the nerve cells are the pathological events that occur afterwards. Concussion can alter the brain's physiology for hours to weeks, setting in motion a variety of pathological events. And this is the part a lot of people are not aware of. Included in the cascade of events unleashed in the brain by concussion is impaired neurotransmission. That means that uh, you might have had um, lost words here, automatic reactions that you've done your whole life. How to use a stapler, how to tie your shoes. All of a sudden that's gone. You know, depending on your injury, depending on what part of your brain got. I know for me, I, I couldn't tie a bow for about a year, year and a half. That just drove me crazy. Uh, loss of regulation of ions, deregulation of energy use and cellular metabolism, and a reduction in cerebral blood flow. Now, who was here saying they had an adjustment? Was that you? You had some kind of an adjustment. You could feel yeah. it was like the blood was coming back. Yeah. So sometimes we get structural stuff that happens in our neck. Maybe that could be causing that. But everybody's different. And uh, cerebral blood flow is impaired after concussion for up to seven to ten days. Same as the brain is starved for glucose after concussion, seven to ten days. So this is the part that a lot of people don't realize because you have the concussion, you're kind of dazed, and you say, oh, that wasn't too bad, and you get on with it. But your brain is, there's things going on inside there, and all of a sudden, more symptoms start presenting themselves. And you're saying, and a lot of people don't even relate it to that accident. And all of a sudden, they, they have trouble coordinating themselves, they have ringing in their ears, they have speech problems, they can't even bend down to tie their shoe without falling over. And they don't realize it's because there's still stuff going on inside with the brain. It wasn't just that one little jolt. Oh, can we get through this here? Excitatory trans neurotransmitters. <laughs> Chemicals such as glutamate that serve to stimulate nerve cells are released in excessive amounts as a result of the injury. The resulting cellular excitation causes neurons to fire excessively. Now, I don't know if you ever felt that yet with your injury and you, you're, you start panicking, you get in a situation where there's too much going on or you, you're too tired or something, you, you start panicking, you almost start shaking even and you're just like, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do, and you just want to get out of there. That's because of this firing excessively. And then you have the limbic brain that kicks in, it's caveman logic. And I know when I got assaulted again by a fire alarm at Health Science Center in 2015, I think it was, it's just like, I was just yelling. And the doctor was behind me saying, can I help you? Can I help you? I said, no, I just got to get out of here. <laughs> and I was in with hundreds of people and I just totally panicked. It's a not a nice feeling because once I did get out of there, I just broke down and cried. And it took me a year to recuperate from that. Um, this creates an imbalance of ions such as potassium and calcium across the cell membranes of neurons, eventually leading to the death of even more nerve cells. That's why you still get more uh, symptoms that build up over time. Brain injury is a chronic, ongoing disease process and not a one-time injury as traditionally thought. These are various ways that the brain can become uh, injured. Everybody can read that from there. The most important one and the most common one that happens to most people is the acceleration, the sudden acceleration, deceleration, and I added rotation on there because like if you're in a car and you get rear-ended, you're doing that and that's going to get you a concussion. What happened to me, I was seeing, le leaning forward and looking out the side view mirror, so not only did I have acceleration, deceleration, but I had rotation and that sheared a lot more brain matter and got me into a lot more trouble. So it's important to know it's not just this. It's like a hockey player. If he gets hit like that while he's doing something, he gets spun around like that. He's got rotation going on in there for an injury. So he's going to have a hell of a harder time. Hello. Hi, sorry. I got and, lost. That's OK. <laughs> and the various causes of concussions, crimes, assaults, and abuse, 5%. Sports, recreation, and playground accidents, 10%. Occupational accidents, 10%. Falls. 30%, percent 
and auto accidents 45. Now, this is kind of interesting because these uh, numbers are changing because as our population <coughs> ages, falls are starting to overtake auto accidents. So I have two friends that are in their 60s and one fell on her back deck stairs and shattered her bone here and another friend of hers was cleaning out her garage and slipped and fell and like, hello, <laughs> they weren't doing anything dangerous, they were just doing stuff around their home. So we don't realize how something as simple as a fall can cause a concussion and give you a hard time for many, many months. Average age for concussion, would anybody like to take a guess? Zero to 19. You think it's 15? <laughs> 25? 30? I would say 30? Average age for concussion in Canada is 10 years old. My first one, I was eight. My husband, his first one, he was seven. He got kabonged over the head with a shovel by a kid out in the playground. <laughs> Symptoms of concussion, uh, these are the basic symptoms, headache, blurred vision, balance and dizziness issues, slurred speech, memory problems, speak, sleep problems, nausea, <coughs> excuse me, and seizure. And you don't have to have all of them. You have one or two, go to the doctor, have this reported as a, as a suspected concussion and let him or her see what they think. These are more uh, intense, uh, uh, symptoms of concussion and if these should arise over the first 24 to 48 hours you should not be left alone and uh, really you should go to the hospital and seek immediate attention. Things like one pupil is larger than the other, inability to recognize people or places, nausea or repeated vomiting, slowing of pulse, unusual bizarre or irritable behavior, any clear or bloody discharge from nose or ears, seizures, dizziness and or confusion, worsening headache, double or blurred vision, weakness or numbness in arms or legs, excessive drowsiness or fainting, unsteadiness or poor balance, slurred speech, decline in alertness and difficulty waiting, waking from sleep. Just one of those deserves attention. And there is a, a sheet back there, a handout, if you can't, this is hard to read, but I did print it out back there, a little easier to read. So if you think you have a concussion, don't hide it, report it, and take time to recover. Don't just dismiss it and say, oh, wasn't anything. And then when your symptoms start building up after the, over the next couple of weeks or so, and you go, oh my gosh. These are some more symptoms of a concussion, dizziness, nausea, vomiting, balance problems, sensitivity to noise, sensitivity to light, blurred vision, headache, low energy level, unequal pupils, and seeing flashing lights. Uh, mental problems of a concussion, difficulty remembering, confusion, inability to concentrate, inability to think clearly, mental fogginess, inability to remember new information, that was a bad one for me. Trouble, pain, attention, loss of focus. Oh, what's that one? Sleeping issues. Sleeping more than usual, unable to fall asleep, sleeping less than usual. Emotional symptoms of a concussion. This is a huge category. People are not, don't seem to be aware of this. Easily angered or upset, feeling nervous or anxious, feelings of sadness, crying more than usual. I was crying at by 10 o'clock every day at my desk. Lack of interest in usual activities and depression. Is it any wonder <laughs> having all that going on? The behavioral and emotional aspects are so huge, uh, especially for pediatric concussions or, and teenagers. Uh, they don't understand that, and especially if they don't understand enough about what a concussion is, they will just slough it off. But then they start having all these behavioral aspects coming on, and if the parents aren't aware of this, they'll just slough it off as a moody teenager. <laughs> so that's why it's important for family members and teachers and uh, uh, friends and especially the person themselves, whether they're just a regular uh, public person or if they're playing sports or anything, they need to be aware of what the symptoms of a concussion are and need to report it. And how long do the symptoms last? I get asked this all the time, generally, and there's no pat answer for anybody generally anywhere from a few days to possibly two to three weeks, but <clears throat> that depends on your age, the level of concussion, and if you've had any prior injuries. 
And if a lot of us don't know, I didn't know. Anything longer and you could be dealing with a more serious recovery, i.e. post-concussion syndrome, we'll get into that a little bit later, or a mild or moderate traumatic brain injury. And I'm a mild, borderline moderate. There's nothing mild about it. Don't let that name throw you. I have a slide coming up here that explains all this. This is from Headway Organization in the UK, what to do if you're concussed. Do make sure you stay within reach of a phone and medical help in the next few days. Do have plenty of rest and avoid stressful situations. Do take painkillers and paracetamol, something they have over there. I think it's just top oh, over yeah. here. Yeah. Don't, take, don't stay at home alone for 48 hours after leaving the hospital. Well, half of us never make it to the hospital because we don't realize we've had a concussion. Uh, don't drink alcohol until you feel better. I would actually say don't ever drink alcohol once you've been brain injured. It's just not your friend anymore. And uh, I've come across research that said if prior to brain injury you got a little depressed when you drank alcohol, after brain injury it'll make you suicidal. It's just the brain can't handle it anymore. And for me, I, it's not enjoyable anymore. It gives me terrible head pains and it's just not fun. So why bother? Don't play any contact sport for at least three weeks without consulting your doctor. And do not drive until you feel you have recovered and if in doubt, consult your doctor. This is something I want to see changed in Canada, definitely here in Alberta. There's no regulations on this. My doctor never said don't drive. And I just self-regulated myself. For seven years, I didn't drive. My husband did most of the driving. And as I progressed and got along, I said, okay, I, I think I, I, you know, so I started doing little short runs and that. But um, when I have setbacks, um, it, you have to start all over again. They have to build up your endurance. And, and uh, it's, it's never ending, it seems. <laughs> but I, I do want to see um, some kind of legislation put in place that uh, anyone who's been diagnosed with concussion, especially with a traumatic brain injury, should be restricted from driving and they um, uh, need testing by a cognitive driving instructor who's aware of the uh, symptoms of what we're putting up with. Do helmets prevent concussions? No. This is still something astonished that the general public is not aware of. Helmets prevent catastrophic skull fractures. They do not prevent the brain from sloshing around inside the skull. I don't care what you put on your head, and if you're still doing the football and the hockey and the bouncing or whatever it is, if you get hit, that brain's still junking around inside there. The helmet does nothing. You may end up with a mild brain injury instead of a severe traumatic brain injury, but still, it's going to change the rest of your life. I'm dealing with a mild traumatic brain injury and I've never been the same since. And it's quite challenging to live with it. How often are concussions undiagnosed? The quick answer is too often. It is important for coaches, teachers, and parents alike to be aware of the symptoms of concussion and take action to report. And also the actual person themselves. The player, young girls, especially in soccer. We'll talk about Rowan a little later. And uh, there's people out there who are out there playing all kinds of organized sports in school or whatever, and they have no idea. Oh, I got this really bad headache after that bad hit, but they're still going out and playing. And that should be reported. They need to realize that is serious and should be reported to their coach. And the coach should be having enough knowledge about this as well, too, to sideline him for a while and have him evaluated. <coughs> The impact of an additional concussion is more severe than the first. It takes patients longer to recover from second or third concussions. <clears throat> also, it can result in what they call second impact syndrome, which is actually fatal. Here's a young girl from Ottawa. Her name was Rowan Stringer. She was 17 years old. She ignored concussion symptoms and died after two head injuries in less than a week. She had a really bad headache from a bad hit, and she didn't tell anybody. She told a friend of hers, and the friend said, well, are you still going to play tomorrow? She said, nothing's going to stop me, because she's just that type of player, eh? And she went out, got re-injured again, and that was it. Her brain couldn't handle it. She, was, she died. So now her parents have become great advocates. They actually have in legislation now something called Rowan's Law, and it's uh, teaching coaches and players more, and other parents more about concussions and how important this <coughs> is and uh, not having players go back on the field before they've been uh, adequately tested. 
Another big thing you'll probably hear about a lot in the media is CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. <laughs> it's progressive degenerative disease and it applies mostly to professional players like hockey players, football players, um, they, wrestling, rugby, boxing of course, bull riding, vi uh, uh, rodeo, any other contact sport who have experienced repeated concussions or other brain trauma. So there's a lot of people I've met who've had 10, 11, 12 concussions and they're fearful, now they got CTE. And I say, <laughs> Excuse me. Well, if you didn't get hit like about a hundred times in the last six months, I don't think you have to worry about CTE. Oh, I forgot to start my timer. Um, and it, as well, too, it can only be diagnosed upon autopsy, which doesn't help the person living with it. But it's the behavioral aspects. I don't know if anybody watched that movie, Concussion. And you saw that player who was living in his car because his wife couldn't put up with his erratic behavior anymore. And he's drinking and doing drugs and all kind of stuff. And he's tasing himself every night so he can knock himself out to get some sleep. So don't tell me they can't tell CTE before they die. Now they have new research coming out. It was just on the news yesterday, I think it was, is that they're trying to work on biomarkers in the blood that will tell them if this person is uh, having CTE happening before they die. So it's still not available. It's something that they're still working on. Oh, that's my 20 minutes is up. <laughs> See how much farther I have to talk. Is that so CCE can affect high school athletes, especially football players and hockey players, following just a few years of activity. In, pre in present, it's presently, uh, there's a typo there, ha, that doesn't happen. <laughs> it presently in uh, domestic violence is now also being investigated and right now they say it can only be accurately diagnosed through autopsy. So here's a picture of a normal brain and this is what advanced CTE looks like, like their brain is just withering away. And that would explain their erratic behavior. So we weren't doing too badly. We do have a break. Everybody would like to take a 10 minute break. Um, I so when does a concussion become a brain injury? Isn't that an interesting question? Concussion is a brain injury. It's not just a knock on the head and oh my God, you know, it's just a concussion, get over it. This is the brain injury we're dealing with here. And repeated concussions can lead to permanent brain damage, which is what happened to me. And I'm not a wild, crazy person. I don't jump off mountains and stuff like that. <laughs> and concussions are also accumulat are cumulative throughout your lifetime. Three to four concussions seems to be the limit. Then you'll be dealing with more complicated symptoms and more complex injury, i.e. mild or moderate traumatic brain injury. Three to four kicks at the can, that's about all you got. And here's a researcher I found, I was so excited when I found him when I was writing my book. I said, I wanna find a researcher who's gonna say what I've experienced. And I came across this guy and he worded it this way, how many is too many? While there is no definitive answer as to how many is too many, it appears that individuals with a history of three or more concussions may be at a potentially increased risk for recurrent concussion, lengthier recovery time after concussion, and potentially even long-term risk later in life. The one that my, my pet peeve is, and Heather and I were discussing this, is that um, I, you see a lot of reports, a lot of media um, articles in the newspaper, and they go, a concussion, i.e. a mild traumatic brain injury. And that just fries me to no end because they're not the same. They're totally different. And uh, the concussion doctor I was working with in New York, she's seen my postings on the Facebook groups and she said, oh, I have a document that's gonna prove that what you're trying to say is correct terminology. And this is from the concussion and sport group consensus statement. And there's uh, about three, I think, uh, professors from the University of Calgary that are on this group. And they meet periodically, I can't remember now if it's every two years or every four years. And after the meeting, they <coughs> have, a, excuse me, a con con consensus statement. And this was from their report, uh, from their tw 2012 meeting, and it was uh, published in this journal. 
in 2014. And number one on their recommendations is the term concussion and mild traumatic brain injury should not be used interchangeably. It's not a slide I came to try and make this simple for most people, is a concussion is part of the traumatic brain, traumatic brain injury continuum. And under that is post-concussion syndrome. That's if you have a concussion, it doesn't get better in two or three months or whatever, um, they start leaning you more towards post-concussion syndrome and explaining that's why your symptoms aren't clearing up yet. I don't know if there's any timelines on this, but uh, there's also persistent post-concussion syndrome. So um, I don't know how they come up with these different terminologies or what the diagnosis is and how they do this, but th they'll throw those terms at you. If your doctor can't figure out what's going on with you, oh, it's post-concussion syndrome. <laughs> so be prepared to fight. If you think it's not that, and you think it's something more serious, um, this is why it's so important to educate ourselves. You're within your rights to ask for a neuropsych assessment and they will test for milder, moderate traumatic brain injury. And then there's also the second impact syndrome. This is what we talked about earlier. This is all under the concussion field here. And then there's also the CTE. We talked about that, that's from multiple concussions. So now we're gonna go across on the red line. And this is where you do not want to be in this territory. There is mild traumatic brain injury, there's moderate, and there's severe. Now generally most of the people I am meeting are actually MTBI, mild traumatic brain injury, as a result of multiple concussions. This was my fourth and it led to MTBI. Now it doesn't mean to say everybody's going to be like that. There's some people who've had a severe enough accident that they've had, never had concussions but they, now they have maybe a moderate or even a severe traumatic brain injury. And that's really gonna affect their lives. Although I've met a couple of women who were severe traumatic brain injury people and you never know how to talk to them. It's just amazing the, the um, improvements that they're making with these types of patients nowadays. So this is how I like to, to clarify it for people new to this field and can't understand all this terminology that everybody's bantering about. Do you have a, something that you go through to say what the difference is or what, di what defines each area? The, um, there is in the book, in the book, there is a scale in there that, and it's, it's probably getting fairly outdated. It was invented or came up with in the 70s, I believe it was, the Glasgow Coma Scale. And they have points on if you can open up your eyes, if you respond and all that kind of okay. stuff. And based on those numbers that they give you, they will categorize you as either mild, and moderate, or severe. We still use the Glasgow. They still do that? Yeah. yeah. So the Glasgow's used back in yeah. if you've got a concussion, yeah. most people I'll, are. I'll put it up on a slide next, or on our next meeting. I'll put it up on a slide so you can see it a little bit easier. Yeah. Or you can get the book from the library if you want. And how are concussions treated? Depending on the severity of the concussion, a, per a patient may be ordered to rest. No exercise, no playing, or computer games. I came across this little graphic that pretty well explains it. No sports, no schoolwork, no screens, no computers, no video games, no TV. <laughs> so, and your doctor would advise you what he thinks or she thinks the time limit for you would be to do that. I've heard mostly average around two months. You said eight months with you? I, I was completely in a yeah, yeah. I was out for eight months. So it, it all depends, because you, you've had so many concussions as well, so that might come into factor as well. No, it was the early ones. The later ones, oh. I was fine. Oh. I was a lot shorter. Ah, okay. Like, no reading. Yeah, no, no reading. reading. Yeah. No like, reading. Listen, because dinner just... conversations. Yeah. I couldn't read. The words were waving off the page. It was amazing. Not amazing. <laughs> it was scary. <coughs> and how are concussions treated? Medication may be re recommended to treat symptoms such as headache, pain, or nausea. Children should not be left alone and they should see a doctor right away. Um, basically, let's go back. Just gonna let me go back. I don't like these arrows. <laughs> Medication may be recommended to treat symptoms such as headache, pain, or nausea. Really, there's no magic pill 
to help you with concussion or brain injury. It takes a lot of work. And it takes finding the right doctor and finding the right therapies. And it's individualized for each one of you. Uh, there's no set pattern. And this is what's frustrating for most people. You get a broken arm, they say, oh, six weeks and you'll be okay. With a brain injury or even with a concussion, sorry, I'm get, I, I call it brain injury, but I mean TBI, even though a concussion is a TBI, but I'm separating it by that red line there. If you have a concussion, your doctor is going to give you different protocols to follow. And every doctor is different, depending on their knowledge and what they think is best. And that's why it's good for us to be educated. And I do have a lot of people saying they go in to these different doctors and different practitioners, even neurologists, and say, I know more than they do. How are they going to help me? It's an evolving field. And they don't know everything. Added tips for recovery. Rest is the best way to recover from a concussion. You need to rest your body and your brain. And the reason that is happening because your brain is healing while you're also busy doing things and you're working. So the brain's trying to heal, but you're keeping it busy. So if you keep it too busy, the brain's going to shut you down. And I've experienced that. I don't know if you have here. You can't talk, you can't walk, you can't even lift my head up, couldn't lift my left arm up. Because I obviously pushed it. The brain is saying, Game over. I need to heal. Quit, quit using me. <laughs> Get plenty of sleep at night and take it easy during the day. So this is the hardest thing because with a concussion and brain injury, your sleep patterns usually get all messed up. I've been dealing with that for so many years. Of course, the strobe lights for me is a, a huge stressor and it sets off everything. Avoid alcohol and illegal drugs. No alcohol at all until you're fully recovered. And even then, you probably can't do it the way you used to in the past. And it's hard for young men to accept this. So I just say, well, you know, they do sell non-alcoholic beers and non-alcoholic wines. You know, you can try those, and you don't have to make a big deal of it. Nobody really pays attention. If you want to enjoy the taste of it and feel socialized with everybody else, you got a can of non-alcohol beer. What's the big deal? And you're making a, a good step for your brain health when you make that decision. Do not take any other medicines unless your doctor says it's okay, and avoid activities that are physically or mentally demanding. And I like this one, housework. <laughs> avoid all housework. Okay, I can get into that. Avoid all exercise, schoolwork, video games, text messaging, or using the computer. And again, like what you said, reading. I'm going to add that to the list. You also may, may need to change your school or uh, work schedule while you recover. Ask your doctor when it's okay for you to drive a car, ride a bike, or operate machinery. Now this is an a obvious point, I think, but a lot of people, once they have sustained a concussion, especially the ones that aren't really aware of it, have different reaction times because of their injury. They might have different visual things going on now because of their injury. And they're out there doing normal things and band saws and all the rest of it. And oh, how'd that happen? <laughs> because things are different and you're not realizing it. And this cu concussion just messes up your whole thinking, your whole brain patterns. And it's not the same. It's like you're in a different world. Your so processors. You, yeah, yeah. And your, and your reaction times. Yeah. You just really do have to take a step back from real life for a while and find out where your equilibrium is and where, what keeps you safe. Use ice pack or a cold ice or a cold pack on any swelling for 10 to 20 minutes at a time. Uh, use pain medicines as directed. Your doctor may give you prescription for pain medicine or recommend you use pain medicine without a prescription like Tylenol. But I must say, if you had that 24/7 head pain, I had that for three weeks. And nothing the doctor gave me would touch it. And people I've been uh, advocating with on Facebook groups, some of them have it for a year, year and a half, and all of a sudden they just, it's gone. And nothing touches this pain, nothing. So all they can do is realize that they have to rest, they have to take care of their body, they have to take care of their brain, and hopefully eventually it will go away. Mine progressed to such a bad pain episode, literally I thought my head was going to explode and I didn't know what to do. So I took a couple pain medicines and I went and laid down, fell asleep. Miraculously, an hour later, the pain was gone. <laughs> I'm so happy. I reported it to my doctor the following Monday. He said, no, 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 don't ever do that. Because he said, when you have a pain episode like that, we don't know what's going on. He said, chances are you may never have woken up again. So 
if you have that, get to the hospital. At least they can do an MRI or CAT scan on you right away and try and figure out what's going on in there. Um, this is a, a group called Complete Concussion Management. Um, they are based in Oakville, but they have uh, concussion clinics that they have all across Canada. And this is their recovery stages of concussion. And they're saying each stage must be separated by at least 24 hours. If symptoms occur at any one stage, then you must return to the previous stage. So they start you out slow here with symptom limited rest. So that was like I say, get up, make a cup of tea and toast, see how you feel with that. That's still too much, it makes you dizzy and you get confused and you can't organize things. You're not ready yet, go back to bed and rest. Then it slowly builds up to light cognitive activity, like uh, maybe a bit of reading or just going out and walking around in your backyard. It's a very slow process. Eventually you'll get to where they will think you're ready for a half day of school or work, and you are experiencing that right now. Uh, yeah, I built up from two hours of work at home. Yeah. And now I'm six hours in the office. Yeah, so it is very slow, steady process. Very frustrating, but it is for the benefit of your future brain health and your mental health. And eventually you will get to return to a full day of school or work. Uh, returning to physical activity, this is uh, more for sports related here. And then they'll let you do a specific sport activity, non-contact practice, medical clearance, full practice, and then game play. Um, you can correlate those to uh, regular life that people are not into sports, that you can see the general progression, the slow progression that you go through. You can't just wake up one day and say, well, hey, I feel pretty good. I'm going to go mo uh, mountain bike riding down the hill. It doesn't work that way. You're just going to re-injure yourself again. This is also Ontario. Uh, another one, this is from the Kids Rehabilitation Hospital Con Concussion Center in uh, Toronto. And this is a kind of a neat diagram. I liked it because they're teaching you energy conservation. Because uh, I don't have that graphic here, but uh, size does matter. A normal person has eight hours of energy they have to use throughout the day, or say 14. A person with a brain injury, six, if you're lucky. So you can't go out there and do everything, the speed you did and everything that you used to do. It's not the same. It's just not the same for you. So you have to learn to conserve your energy. And a lot of that I found out how I did that is eliminating and prioritizing what I thought was important. So say I had, uh, like even today, I had a shirt to return to H&M at uh, Market Mall. And I said, no, I'm not going to do that today. I'll do it tomorrow because i got to get ready and rest up to do this session here. I'm not going to go out and run all these little errands and tire, tire myself out. I'm not going to make it. So you have to still make those decisions throughout your day. And just say, you know, you got ten things on your to-do list. Well, tough. You might be able to do two of them. That's it. So it, it's, it takes a lot of uh, brain power and willpower and discipline to accept that's the way your life is for a little while. It will get better over time. But you just really cannot push it. And then they concentrate on sleep hygiene, and that's keeping a routine and doing things that are calm, dull lights before you go to bed, probably no video games before you go to bed, <laughs> none of that stuff. You want to rest and relax and just kind of drift. That's a huge challenge for me. I have terrible time. Nutrition, they also teach you as well, too, that you eat good food, it's uh, healthy food, and it nourishes your brain. It's going to help your brain uh, recover faster and uh, be a lot better for your whole body all the way around. Uh, relaxation is also a big thing because our limbic brain, our caveman logic always comes up when we don't want it and we start panicking and we're going to get through this. That doesn't work. You're just making things worse. So you have to learn doing relaxation techniques. And there's all different kinds of stuff. We did a script on the May, the last session we had here. You can have somebody walk you through that, or you can record your own and put it onto a MP3 file and play your voice playing through this script to relax your muscles throughout your whole body. There's guided meditations, all this kind of stuff you can be trying, and it just does, it just relaxes you. It's a new way of living. Um, eventually you'll be able to return to school and activity and the big, big, big thing is we still have to learn self-management. Depending on how many injuries you've had, this is not going to go away overnight. There's probably still aspects that you have to be aware of for probably the rest of your life. You'll have good days where, or weeks even or months goes by and say, hey, I, I did pretty good. I didn't have to worry about every, anything and I got through everything. It was fine. But 
something might come along and all of a sudden you go, oh, that's back. <laughs> because you pushed it too much. So it's, uh, it's learning your limitations. And it's really hard. If you're a type A personality, this is going to drive you crazy. That's why relaxation is so important. But this is good that this is uh, how they're teaching kids to deal with this as well, too. And they have to realize they can't go shopping with Susan and Mary anymore. That's my 20 minutes. Stop. I don't think we have much left yet. Um, so it's kind of nice that kids even need to learn that, that they can't be out there doing everything that their friends are. They do have to take in consideration they have their own limitations now that are different from their friends. Um, basically as well too, what you're going to find out if you haven't yet, um, you're faced with a patchwork of services when you're dealing with concussion and brain injury. Um, most provinces have no central policy or planning department for people with acquired brain injury. Services are spread over many ministries, including health, education and training, insurance, workers' compensation, and community and social services. Many aspects of brain injury are under provincial jurisdiction, which lacks adequate or appropriate rehabilitation and post-trauma treatment. And this is how it is in Alberta. I'm hearing wonderful things now in Ontario. They're making great strides and it sounds like a dream world for what we're dealing with here. So eventually, people are, we are working on this. We do want to see change. Um, ideally, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Wellspring. It's set up for people who are dealing with cancer, either the person themselves or their friends or family members, and you have access to all kinds of therapies there and support groups and everything for free. I want to have a similar se uh, session or a center set up here in Calgary for concussions like that. So anybody's been affected, you can come in and learn aromatherapy, you can come in and have a massage done, it won't cost you anything. That's my future plan. There was also an article recently that the CBC put out, and this was about, to, in uh, Nova Scotia, I guess, they had a big review go on about a few years back, and still nothing has changed yet. And these people are dealing with what we're dealing with for years on end and not finding the proper help. And their finances are running low, they're out of work, their families are supporting them, and it's just a, a huge nightmare. And uh, so uh, I, I like this article for the fact that we are illustrating that this is going on across Canada. It's not just you, and it's not just me, and it's not just this guy in Nova Scotia. It's across Canada. And this needs to be addressed and it needs to change. Because, you know, uh, what brought this to the forefront for me too is when my kidneys failed in 2013 and I was in the hospital and they put me on <coughs> hemodialysis and I was assigned a nephrologist. I was assigned a, a, P, a, a renal team that had a nurse, had nurses and had a dietitian and a social worker. And I'm going, holy crap, how come they don't have that for people with brain injuries? So that really got my blood going. So I just like, it's, it's going to happen somewhere, somehow. And there's a lot of people, not just me, a lot of people want to see this change and need this change. Added tips for recovery. Early detection can make all the difference. Like somebody <coughs> saying all their physical stuff got taken care of, but not the, the concussion was never picked up. So early, early detection can make all the difference between a downward spiral and a healthy recovery because you don't understand what a concussion is or a brain injury and how this has affected you and how it's affecting your functionalities and if you lose your job if your wife walks <coughs> out on you and you lose your house you're going to become homeless if you don't have the family supports or the financial wherewithal to to help you through this and uh, <coughs> Toronto, Toronto did a study and I think it was fairly high like 72% of all homeless men and 68% of all homeless women had a history of brain injury before becoming homeless. You can see, if they don't have the supports from their families, they're gonna go, they're gonna be losing their jobs, and losing their homes, and where do you think they're gonna go? And it also has found that proactive involvement, knowledge, self-awareness, and self-advocacy are key to quality of life following brain injury. You cannot rest on your laurels. And you not, cannot have the attitude that said, well, there's nothing they can do to help me. You can't rely on they to help you. You have to do it yourself. 
you have to educate yourself. That's why I'm doing this, to educate you. So it empowers you to go to these doctors and say, I want this, 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 and this. And that's how I walk in and talk to them. And I was like, do you think maybe I should have... I don't do that. I just hit him over the head and I said, you know what, I d I've been dealing with you for a year. Something's seriously wrong here. I'm pretty sure it's mild traumatic brain injury and I need this testing to prove or disprove it. Well, I don't think that's your problem. Really? Well, you didn't know me before this accident. Something seriously is going on here and I'm pretty sure it's this and I need this testing to prove it. I had to fight and I got it, but it took many, 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 many months. <laughs> There is no organized long-term system of community care for the traumatically brain injured. TBI patients without families or financial protection are regulated to the street or incorrectly diagnosed as mentally ill. They suffer outrageous burdens that destroy lives. Learning to live with brain injury is a huge part of the successful rehabilitation programs for many survivor warrior heroes. We have so many titles that we put on ourselves, but I am a warrior. I'm not a survivor because I will not outlive this. Cancer patients outlive their disease. We will not be outliving brain injury. So I consider myself a warrior because I speak up and I'm very vocal about it. But what happens after the Rehope Hab program is finished, once, if you're lucky enough to get into one? I had very minimal. I think I had four visits for occupational therapy, three visits with a social worker, and I did push and I got two months of speech therapy. And after that, I'm still basically, you're on your own to figure out how to live with this and how to integrate what they taught you uh, into your life to, to be able to get, keep going. Your base, I was, I've been on my own since 2003, trying to figure out how to live like this. Many TBI persons and their families are left to fend for themselves, trying to figure out what works best for their own particular situations and trying to find the resources they may still require to live successfully in spite of brain injury. And I forget your name. Terry. Terry. You are the biggest hero I have ever seen because this man is paying out of pocket for all his therapies. He's going to massage and all kinds of things. I can't remember okay. everything I've going I've even got for. a new one on there too. Oh, what you got now? Uh, neuroplasticity. <gasps> oh, wonderful. That's the one I've been really working hard over this summer. Yeah, now. yeah. And you're paying out of pocket for all this. Isn't that a bloody shame? It just breaks my heart. So we do have some financial resources out there, not very much. Basically, if you're still working, you have your extended health benefits and depending on your job, I, I worked at the university and we did have a health spending account. So my massages were being paid out of there and I had to make that $500 last a year because the massage was like 90 bucks a visit. So <laughs> I had to try and make it through. Um, as well, too, depending on your workplace, your employer, you may be paying in for long-term disability. Look into that. I was at the university. I'm so thankful I did because I don't have a pension even after working there for 30 years because I was a contract employee, but I was paying into LTD. So if it wasn't for that, because I would just qualify for CPP disability, it's, it does, I barely pays my rent. So luckily I have the LTD through my workplace and that helps me stay alive. Um, there's also Alberta Health Funding. I just discovered this a couple of weeks ago for low-income people because I'm in that crowd now. I'm not working. But the total family income must be 24-9 or below. Um, there's also the assured income for the severely handicapped, also called AISH. Probably a lot of people here have heard about that. It's for people who are 18 years or older, and uh, it says severely handicapped. So that means it has to be a condition that you will have for the rest of your life. And a lot of people with TBI have to fight to get this. I hear horror stories down in the US. I don't know at all what this is involved, but I looked at their package to apply for it. It's quite intense of everything that you have to provide to them. Once you're a senior, it doesn't, you don't get it. No? No. Wow. Then you're relying on just whatever CPP and OIS you get and GIS. Something else. Now, th those were financial resources. Here are coping resources. There is the Calgary Childhood Complex Concussion Clinic at the Alberta Children's Hospital for children up to 18 years old. 
So there was a family that came here once and they had a young teenage girl and they were freaking out and they said, well, we're looking for financial resources. And I said, well, <laughs> there isn't any. Unless you qualify for any of those programs and you go through your medical through both of your workplaces for both parents. There's also the Calgary Brain Injury Program through Alberta Health Services, Coping with Concussion. It's a two-hour self-management workshop. <coughs> phone number you can call for that. There's also a handout back there. You're welcome to take that, but I forgot to put the phone number on there, so you'll have to write that on there if you're interested in that. And I, again, I don't know anything about that, and, I, and it's a two-hour self-management workshop, so you're, I would encourage to go to see what other knowledge you can pick up along the way. Has anybody here been to that one? Oh, yeah, yeah. Best thing I gained was Tanya telling me to come here. <laughs> Thank you, Tanya. Yeah, they offered two. One is like an interview before you have. Sorry. No, take your time. Before you're three months in, one is for sort of persistence afterwards. Oh, okay. Yeah. I came across this pamphlet at the kidney clinic of all places and um, it talked about coping with concussion. I go, oh, didn't know about that one. I was told I was too old <laughs> and that, uh, you know, it's too late. Oh my. <laughs> no, never too late as far as I'm concerned. There's also for management resources, uh, there's concussion clinics in Calgary, um, acute sport concussion clinic that's at the U of C. And there's this business downtown, Ascent Integrative Health Concussion Management. I know nothing about these two. So I know the doctor who runs the first one. Mm -hmm. um, so she's a sports med doctor and she started the acute clinic okay. years ago. And the second one offers some things. Oh, and that one is sports related only, ages 13 to 60, and it had to have occurred in the last yeah, four it's weeks. Just acute, yeah. but the second that doesn't one, help any of us here, does it? The okay. second one offers some services, but they're not. Um, they don't offer like the full breadth of healthcare professionals yeah. or allied health in yeah. terms of like what they offer the clinic. It's mostly chiropractic and physio. Yeah, and this is that other company I was telling you about from Oakville. Um, from what I saw on their website. Um, this would be something I would be checking out if I was still needing. Uh, early help. Uh, it's called Complete Concussion Management and they have three clinics here in Calgary and I knew about Peak Health and Performance on Albo Drive but I didn't realize they were part of this uh, conglomerate here or whatever. It's some a specific training program they have for de uh, dealing with concussions. Again you're paying out of pocket for this so and CBC put up this article, this was in 2016 I think, yeah, last November, private concussion clinics called the wild west of unregulated treatment, so buyer beware. And that's it. So, yeah. another one that you might want to add is the community accessible rehabilitation, so that's through either South Shumir or um, Peter Lockheed, which is where I went, and that's for early stage concussion give you access to occupational therapists. Community? Accessible rehab, it's free, it's through your doctor. It's gotta be yeah. early, early days though. I went after, it was over a year after. Yeah, I went. Okay. Yeah, because I went, uh, what was it? Four years afterwards. Four years after, yeah. Wow. There's also I managing concussions too late. Managing concussion course that in front of the, job, the doctors, physios, OTs are running, and there's it's an online course and there's three days, so one, the first date was in May, I'm going to the October session, and then there's another one in February. And who is this through? Oh, it's for healthcare professionals, but the, oh, there'll be more, um, there should be like more healthcare professionals that are certified in managing concussions. Yeah. So I know I'm doing yeah. the October course, but I know there's a February one and there was a May one as well. Oh, okay. um, the complex concussion one that you mentioned up there, uh -huh. um, they with the new guidelines on what a concussion clinic needs to have, which is your buyer beware thing, they don't technically need it at this point, but they may be adapting it. Okay. And then there's also the Brain FX program as well, which is run by Tracy Milner, and she's an OT, and she does a concussion stuff. Brain FX? Brain FX. Oh, FX. FX, yeah, the letters. Oh, FX. And she runs F -X. Oh, yeah, okay. Brain FX. Tracy? Tracy Milner. It's the name of the person who started it. She also okay. runs a um, injury clinic that deals mostly with That's good to know. workplace injuries and motor vehicles. Good, thank you. Yeah. And then I'll just finish off here with our, for next week, or next month, will be October 26th. 
and future topics we'll be talking about is tools for coping and family experiences and we're working on bringing in some future speakers I have a doctor of vision therapy she wants to come in I'm probably aiming for November for her and a concussion doctor this is uh, in New York the concussion doctor I mentioned and I do the interviews with her she wants to come in on video and interact with our meetings and we also I had an idea, me and uh, Josephine, we would like to bring in some family physicians and get their input on to why is it so hard for us to get help and <laughs> that kind of thing. So that's basically it for the presentation today.